Everybody, welcome back to another episode of This Week in Finance, a podcast by Financial Friends and hosted by me, Brendan, the founder of Financial Friends. If you're new to Financial Friends, it is a community of people who love business, finance, and investing related content. So if that's you, consider subscribing. We're on the road to 1,000 friends or 1,000 subscribers here on the channel, and I would greatly appreciate your support. Before we get into the video of everything that I found interesting over the course of This Week in Finance, consider hitting that like button as well. It helps push this video to more people, and I would greatly appreciate that support as well. It is free. It doesn't cost anything. And we pretty much are looking for some free things after this week in the market. Let's go ahead and dissect things and get right into it. We're going to be talking Fed, Coinbase, layoffs, Bitcoin, Netflix, streaming, um, TikTok and Facebook. And of course, a uh, little fun one at the end, <laughs> the gentleman who's been tracking rich people's uh, jets. We're going to be talking about that as well. So let's go ahead and get into things. Here is the S&P 500 over the course of the last five days. We can see here we had a steep drop off um, on the 13th. I think that was Monday. And then another drop again here on the 14th. But the 15th brought some good news. The Federal Reserve raised interest rates, which overarchingly is a good thing. Of course, we're looking to bring down inflation, slow down the economy. We're going to talk a little more about that in a second. But it was good news because we got something that we expected and the market reacted positively to that. We could see here a little bit of a spike and then right at about two o'clock when that announcement was made, boom, shot right back up. Um, Jerome Powell was on the stage or was, you know, behind a podium giving some information. People enjoyed, at least at the time, what he was saying. Markets did go ahead and close up. And then today we got absolutely hammered. Again, you can see right here the Dow, S&P, NASDAQ, and Russell scores or percentages. And then behind me on the board as well, um, you can see them. I try and keep those up to date every single video. Sometimes they don't get updated just because of the timing of the video. But either way, got absolutely hammered today and gave up everything that was gained yesterday, which really wasn't quite that much. But in regards to the actual Federal Reserve interest rate hike, I just released a video today, which is Thursday, but by the time you're seeing this, it will have been about three days ago. It'll be linked up above. Go ahead, check it out. It is in regard to this interest rate hike, a little bit about me and my personal portfolio, why I'm still borrowing, or I'm sorry, why I'm still buying, why people shouldn't continue to borrow because of the rates going up, um, and really how this is going to slow borrowing, slow margin debt, slow everything down, really the same thing that has been going on the last two interest rate hikes, and then again on this third one. Um, the market loved it. Like I said, again, the market loved it. The market liked what Jerome Powell had to say. After a little bit of further dissection, it seems that some people on Wall Street weren't huge fans of it. Um, it his confidence didn't really come across is what they said. Seems that he might have been targeting the wrong areas of inflation, mentioning they were going to you know, continue to rate hike um, until inflation in food and oil or gasoline energy was coming down. Really things that like those people were saying on Wall Street, he can't really control or the Fed cannot really control those things. Um, we're still in a bear market. Stocks are still down. Basically, it means I'm still buying. Go ahead, check out that video. It has the full story on really why I think you should continue to buy, why I think that bear markets and recession is all going to be this FUD talk. And in the long term, just go ahead and buy that dip all the way down, buy it on the way up again. And, and in the end, you'll be better off. This whole fear um, mongering thing, which is really more from the, the media and just from general talk. I mean, when people are trying to write stories and make a living, they can't just write Federal Reserve hikes rates. Best course of action for investors is to buy the dip like that would be really boring. So instead, it's tragedy. The world's falling apart. Things are going to be terrible. And I think as we move forward, we're going to continue to see things that aren't quite that good. And I think this next story touches on that a little bit. That being that Coinbase is laying off 18% of the workforce. We never like to see things like this. Obviously, it's semi a direct cause of the economic environment that we're in. And then also the Federal Reserve raising interest rates by nature is going to push that recession narrative. It potentially could induce a recession because companies can no longer continue to borrow to grow. They also are not going to want to expand in a recessionary period, thus causing them to lay off people. The Federal Reserve's job is to kind of keep the peace between inflation and unemployment and keep the economy, which really is a force of supply and demand and 
again, inflation, which is supply and demand based, and then also employment, which is relatively supply being the workers and demand being the people who need those workers. But in general, we are really going to see this, this tug and pull between the two. And we're going to try to not have people become unemployed, but by nature, raising rates and getting tighter with monetary policy is going to force unemployment. We see that here. Uh, Coinbase lays off 18% of its workforce to prepare for, here's that keyword again, recession and a crypto winter. Uh, Brian Armstrong, the CEO, pretty much says, look, we grew way, way too quickly during this bull run and we really need to cut people because we're not going to be able to sustain during this time. This also has a massive uh, part to do with the fact that Bitcoin is down. I'm going to touch on that. Well, let's just touch on it right now because it'll help connect the dots. As Bitcoin falls, so does Coinbase. So do the kind of cryptocurrency brokerages. I think Coinbase is really the only major one. Robinhood sometimes gets tied in there as well. Um, let's actually see. Let's take a look because I'm curious if Robinhood gets pulled into that. Um, relatively, not quite as correlated. You could see the the, the drops in Bitcoin drop significantly more with Coinbase, but actually it's a relatively similar fall there in Robinhood as well. But okay, so you could see the correlation, right? As Bitcoin falls, Coinbase falls. Coinbase produces revenue um, off of trading fees and, and different things like that. And so when you have this sort of non-invest in, in Bitcoin or sell all my Bitcoin and get out, Coinbase isn't gonna be able to continue to do what they do and they're not going to be able to advertise, drum up excitement around Bitcoin when the thing is literally crashing to the ground. Um, dropped 57% year to date and 55% in the last six months. And in the last month, 32%. And then Coinbase is down at 27% as well. So when your stock's falling, employees are losing faith, you, you got to cut people. You got to make a healthier company, which is really what they seem to be doing. They also had some people internally potentially at least, um, not very happy with what was going on in the company. Apparently, uh, you could see here that they created a vote of no confidence regarding the executives. Um, and then the CEO took to Twitter and pretty much said, yeah, if you don't have confidence in us, just quit. Um, which I guess is good for him because he has to lay people off anyway um, and good for the person because he's exactly right. If you don't have faith in what you're doing at work, you probably shouldn't be working there. Um, but that's the Coinbase story. And I think we're gonna continue to see these layoff stories, unfortunately, initially, just like with Coinbase, right? We saw this hype, this bull run, this massive hiring that they were doing. And then all of a sudden it's, oh, we got to pause hiring. We can't, we can't take in any more bodies. We can't take any, in any more people. And then the smaller companies hit first where they're like, yep, we're going to lay people off. Now these types of companies, these growth companies, companies that are tied to markets like this, very volatile stocks, they're going to cut people. And really the last to do so would be companies like Coca-Cola, Pepsi, big, massive companies that probably have their their supply chain relatively okay. Demand for their products is still there. Pricing power is still there. They can continue to pass uh, different costs and inflation costs to consumers so that they don't have to fork those over and essentially fire people to make up the difference. So that is this unemployment story. We're going to keep our eye on it as it continues to unfold um, because it will definitely be something to watch as we teeter on the edge of recession. We're going to find out in July if we're in a technical recession. Um, hopefully, unemployment doesn't just come crashing right after that. Hopefully, unemployment stays at good levels for the sake of everybody in this world and in this country. Uh, but moving on to something a little bit different, and that is streaming and yet another stock that has been hit very, very hard. Netflix, as you could see in the title, once a great disruptor, is now taking ideas, basically ideas that are thought of as old or that legacy companies have previously done or have thought of as legacy concepts to try and spark growth. The stock is down about 70% this year. Uh, let's go ahead. We'll pull up the chart just for the fun of it if it decides to load. Here is after the close down 3.75%. Let's get this on a six month chart. You can just see the drop here. Um, steep, steep drop and year to date, just a just a big fall as well. Um, beginning of this year, we were up at, gosh, 605, all the way down to 137 now. So not super great for Netflix. However, there's about six things here in this article that they look towards to potentially spark growth. They're gonna embrace advertising. This is something that Paramount, 
I think Paramount Plus has. Well, we could check in a second, but Paramount Plus, um, Disney Plus is thinking about it. HBO Max has it. Peacock has it. Hulu has always had it. And that's advertising on the platform, putting mid-roll ads, like in a YouTube video, um, something similar to that. This is something they have never, ever, they've basically thought of as like, we're above this, right? Um, that we don't necessarily have to do this, but it helps the cost for consumers fall. If you can take in advertising revenue, you can cut the price level of the subscription. You can make that subscription more attractive to consumers, which then puts advertisers in a spot where more eyeballs will be on their ads. So you can then upcharge for that and you can potentially make more money than you could have ever dreamed of if things work out exactly the way the margins work, exactly the way that you assumed for them to be. And now they're they're getting into this late. All of these other companies, you could see um, Amazon does not have a subscription, but you can get the service for $13 basically a month with Prime. Um, you do have Disney Plus thinking about it, but again, a bundle with three other services, or three services total rather, for $14, which is really good. You have Apple, standalone's only five bucks. A whole bundle's only $15. Then you have Hulu ad supported for $7, HBO Max ad supported for $10, Disney, or I'm sorry, Discovery Plus ad supported for $5, Paramount Plus ad supported for $5, and Peacock is free. And then Peacock with ads is $5. So you really have this $5 or so price point, and Netflix is sitting at $10 right off the rip which is the most expensive across the board other than HBO Max, which has a lot of massive legacy style movies on it. Um, and also movies like Harry Potter and different things like that that are, that are really, really attractive to the average consumer. Netflix tends to have a little bit more niche shows, but like cult-like following shows. Um, but that $10 price point is steep. And then you go to standard, which is one user in just better viewing, you know, HD. $15 and 49 cents. Uh, and then you have premium, which is three plus users and then ultra HD for 20 bucks a month. That's just absolutely absurd. Lower the cost, use ads. And they're trying to do it now. Seems to be a little bit late to the game. In my opinion, you also have developing shows. So they've been bringing a lot of shows straight to series, essentially skipping any type of pilot episode. Obviously a terrible idea when you think of the fact that any one show could flop and you might have poured millions of dollars into that. Those are just losses that you can't accrue back in new membership because the show sucks. So um, something again that it just seems logical to do. Granted that, you know, they mentioned here in the article, you have people like actors and, and filmmakers and developers or producers who are like, uh, yeah, we want to go straight to series. Like we don't want to mess around with the pilot episode, but at the end of the day, it hurts your bottom line. So that's kind of a you decision at Netflix. Next is the way that you can view. So normally they drop a whole entire series of something right away, right? A whole season. And that kind of felt like the norm until a lot of new companies or, or companies that are just now getting into streaming like Disney Plus and others didn't do that. They went to that legacy TV format where you drop one episode a week. And I think that's good because it develops this conversation, this hype, this, um, you know, really just a talking point for people to make on a show or on some form of topic. And I think that that's good when you can get people talking and sharing on social media about your show. It drums up excitement, could potentially get some new customers on board. Granted, I don't think you're signing up millions and millions and millions of people because you're dropping one episode a week, but advertising along the way and drumming up that excitement is really, really crucial. It's something that you do before a movie, so why not do it mid-show? Something that they have never done and something that they might start to do soon. Next is live sports. They did just do an F1 um, show on Netflix, their first real delve into sports. Now they're bidding on F1. So it goes pretty quick. Um, Hastings, who's the CEO said, yeah, we're never ever gonna follow a competitor. We're not gonna do it. We don't wanna copy people. We don't need sports. We don't want sports. We don't do sports. Yeah, you do sports now because you're falling behind because everybody else has something and you don't have it. You need to do it. Sports is that. We're gonna touch on that in just a second here. Next is password sharing. And this is really something that a lot of these companies should consider doing at some point. But the fact that Netflix is starting to lose subscribers 
They probably want to drum up some more revenue. Their stock's down 70%. They need that extra money to come in and make their earnings and such look better. They're going for it. They're going to be the first one to figure out how to make money off of the people who are mooching other people's passwords. That's going to do one of two things. You're either going to get those people that are never going to watch the show. They're not going to talk about it. They're not going to be a plus for you in terms of talking to others about shows and about content, or you're going to get more revenue from them because they are going to subscribe to the platform. They're going to mooch or stop mooching, I should say, off of that person, and you're not going to collect your 2 to $3 fee that you're charging for extra people, and instead they're going to subscribe and you might make extra revenue or they might just pay the two to three dollar extra fee and you're gonna make extra revenue that way. Um, either way, it, it, it kind of seems good for Netflix if they can get some people to stay. For the people they lose, they might get some to stay, might make extra money, whatever. Um, but it is something that in the public eye is looked at as a negative, so who knows? And then last year, we have the fact that they're uh, not a pure streaming play. So for the longest time, they were always literally a streaming play. Like quite literally, they just did streaming, nothing else. Then they got into obviously like producing the movies and stuff. Still a pure streaming play, just a streaming platform. But then you take um, a look at companies like Amazon, like Apple, like Disney, like uh, Warner Brothers, or Warner Brother Discovery, I should say, um, and NBC or Comcast, and that's Peacock, Discovery Plus, HBO Max, uh, Peacock, Discovery Plus, HBO Max, Disney Plus, Apple TV Plus, or Apple TV, or whatever it is called, um, and Amazon Prime Video. So you take all of those, and then it also loops in like Hulu and stuff um, underneath this Disney umbrella. All of those companies do something different, all of them. They all have other platforms, other things. Um, Amazon is Amazon, of course. They deliver all your packages to your house, and they do video or streaming. Apple is Apple. They create the cell phone I have here, the watch I have, the video I'm filming, the iPad I have. Right? They do all these other things. They have music streaming and all this other stuff, so they're not just, just on video streaming. You have Disney, who has ESPN, ABC, Linear Television, Disney+, Plus, Hulu, physical content, live parks. Okay, so they don't they don't do just streaming. Um, you have Warner Brothers, who has HBO, who has Discovery Plus. Um, so they're not again just just one platform. They have you know diversity in what they're doing. They also produce. They're a big big movie studio. That was where they got their start. They do that first and foremost. And then you have Comcast, who is literally Comcast, right? Xfinity. They have Peacock. They have the Universal Parks. Um, so again, they are not just linear, just streaming. Netflix until this point, and really still is, just streaming. They do nothing else, okay? They now have 22 video games on their platform and aim to have 50 by the end of the year. Quite literally, that's the stupidest thing I've ever seen in my whole entire life. That's just dumb, right? You're not signing up for Netflix to play video games. They tried to get into like the licensing consumer goods and t-shirts and like selling merchandise for their shows. And I don't think it worked if I remember correctly. Um, but now they're trying to sell you video games on their platform. I, I don't know. I, I need to see the numbers behind this really, because I don't know if this is like good for them. Like are people signing up to play video games or are, are people who already have subscriptions playing video games? And if the people who already have the subscription are playing video games on the platform, you didn't get anyone new to sign up and it cost you money to make the, I'm just so lost. I, I honestly don't, if you know anything about this, if you've played the games, if you think they're good, let me know in the comments. I genuinely have no clue why they're doing that, but whatever. Anyway, it's a stretch. They're trying to drum up more interest. Someone, their competitor is doing that. Apple has signed MLS to a 10 year deal to broadcast MLS, which is major league soccer on TV plus. They are looking at, this is the one part of it that I don't necessarily love, but I completely understand. They have the Apple TV Plus subscribers who pay five bucks a month. You'll be able to watch some of the matches, but there's going to be a separate cost to other people. So that way you can get all of them. It makes sense. They've also already jumped into Major League Baseball games on Friday nights. So they're getting sports on their platform. They've already committed 
to quality over quantity in terms of shows. They have good shows like Ted Lasso. There's another one I'm watching now, and, and, and the name is evading my brain. I can't seem to think of it, but it's a really good show as well. Um, ben Stiller, I think, is in it. Anyways, they are doing what Netflix has failed to do. They accepted that they need sports on the platform. They're accepting this form of growth. They're taking it as growth. They're making sure they're going to do it right. Granted, they also do a bajillion other things that Netflix doesn't do. But again, this is going to be good for Apple. This is going to be good in terms of revenue for them. This is a reoccurring revenue stream. They're going to bring on new people to this platform as a result. We don't have any numbers on this platform whatsoever. No one knows anything about how many people have actually signed up. But my guess is this is going to bring in more people. Soccer is a massive sport football sorry if you're from a different part of the world but in general this continues to signal strength for sports espn plus is one of my quote-unquote major holdings they hold a lot of disney they own espn and as a result espn plus so this signals strength to me that this is good for disney and espn plus as well on the flip side of it of course um this competition there's going to be more eyeballs on sports. There always is more eyeballs on sports as time goes on. Who can have those sports is the real question. Can Disney and ESPN garner that attention? They do have a lot of sports on their platform, a lot more than any of their competitors, their ESPN. Um, but can the ESPN Plus platform, the paid version of this, do well? That is yet to be seen in terms of new companies jumping into the space and adding new sports to their platforms. Enough of streaming. Thank you for sticking with me on that. Hopefully the timestamps were below. You could skip around if need be. Let's talk TikTok. If you haven't noticed, I've been stepping up my TikTok game a little bit with financial friends. Hopefully you've noticed. Go ahead, check out the TikToks. Um, You could go through all the older ones, see how cringy they are, and then see the new ones. And I'm putting in a little bit more work to them. Anyhow, TikTok executive came out and said, look, we are not a social network like Facebook. We're an entertainment platform. And I went ahead and read this um, article and I pulled a couple of key things from it. Really, it seems that Facebook is copying TikTok. That's really the main point of this. Instagram Reels, if any of you are familiar, are these short form videos exactly the same as TikTok. TikTok came out, it was 15 second videos. Then they release one minute videos. Instagram Reels starts with 15 seconds and then they have one minute videos and then TikTok comes out with three minute videos and now Instagram Reels has three minute videos. And it seems like they're just taking the same stride that TikTok is every single time. And it seems to be working for a lot of creators on the platform. A lot of creators, a lot of bigger people can take advantage of these Reels and really create engaging content with it. But from a social perspective, Um, launching reels on Facebook and then now kind of watching the slow death of Instagram, which really everyone seems to be commenting on these days. Um, It is cringy. Facebook is moving stride and stride with TikTok and it's actually sad. Uh, The TikTok executive came out. He was a former Facebook employee for 12 years, actually. um, And he basically said, look, stop trying to move with us because you do something different. Okay. TikTok, is entertainment. So you aimlessly scroll a group of random people, you have no attachment to these people whatsoever, and even if you see someone, you might follow them, but do you really go over to that that following tab and watch their videos, exclusively their videos? No. Every once in a while, you'll tap on the page, you'll scroll through the person's stuff, but I don't know anyone who like follows a bunch of people and then only watches their content and then gets off the app. Everyone loves that endless for you page. Facebook made a comment and said, and and I really don't like this. I think this is really bad. Facebook app chief Thomas Allison told The Verge this week, he sees TikTok increasingly stealing share. This is obvious. Facebook, this this is so bad. Facebook plans to modify its primary feed to look more like TikTok by recommending more content regardless of whether it's shared by friends. Let that sink in while I take a drink. This means you went on to Facebook, which clearly started as a social platform for you to connect with people and has increasingly became more elderly driven. That's not a negative thing whatsoever, but it has continually done that, continually grown in that direction. 
People add their friends and their family so they can see updates from their friends and their family. And now you're just gonna push some random guy face planting on like a brick pavement thing and like laughing or like mimicking one of the presidents or something to just random people. That is not what you do. You don't do that. On Instagram, you follow people you know and whose content you wanna see. On Facebook, you add people for a very specific reason. TikTok, you go on there to watch random people that you've never seen before do funny things and make funny jokes and tell you how to cook different meals. Now that's gonna be done on Facebook. It is literally a direct copy. It further deepens my negative feelings towards Facebook. I will not invest in Facebook or Meta whatsoever directly. I will invest indirectly. I think they're a growing company in the meta sort of space. They still have one of the most massive revenue streams of all time in terms of advertising and control the internet completely uh, with Facebook and Instagram and WhatsApp and now meta. But regardless, I, I just, I won't. I will not invest in Facebook. Um, they're fighting the complete wrong battle here. And there's an absolutely fantastic comparison um, that actually the gentleman who came over, his name is Blake Chanley. He worked at Facebook and then he went to, to TikTok. Sorry if you heard the dryer go off in the background there um, doing some laundry. Anyways, so uh, Blake Chanley here was at Facebook, moved over to TikTok, and he said this. You remember when Google was creating Google Plus? At Facebook at the time, we had war rooms and it was a big deal and everybody was worried about it. I remember that I joined Google+. Google+, Plus was a direct copy of a social network exactly the same as Facebook. And it did not work whatsoever. Google realized it. I don't even know if it's around anymore, but Google is a search platform. You search stuff on it, you search on YouTube, search on Google search, and you find out information. They have maps, they have apps, they have things that connect, an internet of things, if you will. They have a cell phone. You can use all those internet of things on the cell phone. You can use the search on the cell phone. It all connects, it all makes sense. They are not a social platform, except for YouTube. Granted, it's a search engine, essentially, with videos attached to it. Facebook is trying to be TikTok so badly, it, it, it just is gonna, it's not gonna work. Facebook Reels is exactly what like to TikTok as Google Plus was to Facebook. They're just mimicking what happened to them to another platform in an effort to stay relevant in a space that they just don't need to be relevant in. That's my personal opinion. That's what I believe. Um, again, TikTok is for entertaining videos, not your friends' videos. Facebook is for your friends' videos and not for random people's videos. End of story for me. I think this is completely weird of Facebook and I am not gonna chase their stock and invest in their stock when they are completely chasing something that is not in their space. Last topic here. That was a little bit of a rant, I, I won't lie. I, I just don't understand what they're trying to do. I, I'm not a fan. Anyways, moving on here, last topic. Um, if you've been keeping up with the world of billionaires, you know that there's this younger kid on Twitter who has created bots that will track, it'll it'll aggregate data that's already public knowledge on the location of Mark Cuban's jet, Elon Musk's jet, other famous people like Donald Trump. Um, who else? I know it's in here somewhere. Tom Cruise, Taylor Swift, and Mark Zuckerberg. It tracks their jets and it tells you where it is and you can just go on Twitter and find it out. Elon Musk in the past has asked if this kid would take it down for $5,000. The kid said, give me a Tesla and I'll do it. He didn't do that, so his jet is still being tracked. Uh, his name is Jack Sweeney, the gentleman who has created these bot things. Um, and Mark Cuban, this is gonna be really small, basically said, hey man, this is a danger to me and my family. What can we do to take this down? The kid said, hey, I put a lot of work into this. I'm not just gonna take it down for no reason. This is public information that people could connect the dots on anyway. So I'm not too sure I'm like directly harming you. A Little bit of back and forth. And eventually Mark Zuckerberg said, look, you're gonna understand this one day, yada, yada. What do you want from me? And I'll do it. The kid asked for a Tesla and Elon Musk ended up shooting back with basically, I'm sorry, Mark Cuban shot back with basically, look, we're not gonna do this. Um, I could basically make this really bad for you, I think, basically, if I wanted. You have my open support for the rest of your life, and probably Elon Musk's, if you just stop tracking his jet, too. We both probably think this is, like, really cool that you did this, but we don't want our jets being tracked, and they agreed on that. So, Mark Cuban will give this kid business advice for the rest of his life. Um, he'll be able to go to a Mavs game 
in the future because they're not in the playoffs anymore. They got kicked out by the Warriors. Anyway, that game's on the night I'll be watching. Um, and he said, yeah, sure. Here's my email. Next season, we'll do a game. You basically have access to me for the rest of your life. Any business questions, I'll help you do whatever you want. I think personally, that's a pretty good trade-off. You put a ton of work into something. You want to see it come to fruition um, and be really cool. And he's still tracking all of these other people's jets. And now he has Mark Cuban as a friend whenever he wants them. I should tell you that's a good trade-off. So with all that being said, that about wraps up this episode of This Week in Finance. I hope that you learned something new. I hope you found this entertaining in some way, shape, or form. Let me know down below what topics you found most interesting this week. I'd be really curious to know the answer to that. And also from the question in the middle, middle of the video, what in the world is going on with these Netflix games? If you play them, let me know down below in the comments. Thank you all for watching. Thank you for the support. If you didn't already, hit the like button on this video. If you made it this far, go ahead, hit subscribe if you're not already and hit the bell. That way you can be notified when a new one of these episodes or one of my other videos comes out. I will see you all on Tuesday. Take care.